Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Justin. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk you through what's going on in Saudi Arabia's residential and commercial office landscape. I'm going to try and unpick some of the drivers in the market there for you as well. Um, so just to kick things off, let's start by talking about what's going on in the residential sector. Um, I appreciate there's a lot of data on that slide there, but basically what I wanted to do was kick things off by just reminding ourselves of where we are in terms of residential prices in Saudi Arabia. So the numbers on that slide there indicate prices in rials per square meter across Riyadh, Jeddah, and the Demam metropolitan area for villas and apartments. The percentages indicate year-on-year -year change. So if we start with Riyadh, for example, apartment prices have actually increased by 17% over the last 12 months. Villa prices are up 10%. It's a similar-ish story in Jeddah. Apartment prices are up about 12%. Villa prices, not so much, about a percent or so. And in the demand metropolitan area, villa prices are down by about 2% over the last 12 months. Um, to us, that's an indication of some persistent affordability issues, which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. But, you know, we're looking at things from such a macro level here. Saudi Arabia is a huge country. There's a lot of complex moving parts beneath these numbers. So I'm going to try and talk a little bit about what's actually driving the market at the moment. So I've identified for you four key drivers in the residential real estate space at the moment. First of all, we've got Program HQ. Now, Justin alluded to this a second ago. This is Saudi Arabia's drive to get businesses from around the region to relocate their headquarters to Riyadh's King Abdullah Financial District by 2024. Is it going to happen overnight? Probably not. But we are already seeing businesses committing to relocating to Riyadh. Earlier this month, about 40 blue chip businesses said they would do so by the end of 2024. Um, one of the biggest companies so far that's made the decision to relocate from Dubai to Riyadh's uh, KAFD has been Al Arabiya, who said that they would do that. Um, in turn, that is going to create new jobs in Riyadh, therefore creating demand for residential property. Now, Justin also talked about Vision 2030, which is part of the Kingdom's National Transformation Plan to essentially reinvent and rebuild Saudi Arabia. As part of that vision, we are seeing a huge number of new government entities being set up across the kingdom. This is creating new jobs and therefore demand for residential property. The uh, Vision 2030 is also attracting new businesses to set up in the kingdom for the first time. We are seeing record numbers of new companies establishing themselves in Saudi. Um, and that again is creating new jobs and demand for residential property. And finally, pro the provision of world-class housing to Saudi nationals is a key pillar of Vision 2030. Um, and it's leading to a very active residential development pipeline, and I'll show you some data on that in a second. A point that isn't on this slide is a sort of overarching piece about a structural change in demand that's being driven by a change in society. More than half of Saudi's population is below the age of 35. We are already seeing a decline in household sizes and a decline in multi-generational living. Right now, the household size in Riyadh, for instance, is at 5.75. If that drops even to 4.75 in the next 10 years, suddenly we've got such a surge in requirements for property. It's also now more culturally acceptable to live in an apartment instead of a villa. And as part of Vision 2030, Riyadh is being positioned as a key hub for Saudi and for the region. And what that's doing is it's actually drawing in Saudis from other cities in Saudi. What that means is we're seeing a lot of internal migration, which again is creating extra demand for apartments in Riyadh as opposed to villas. So I mentioned earlier that we've got a very active residential development pipeline. Don't, don't worry too much about that. We're just looking at, at the projected numbers of units we're expecting. By the end of 2023, we're expecting about 100,000 new homes to be built in Riyadh. Um, in Jeddah, it's about 40,000 new homes. By the end of the decade, Riyadh is expected to see about half a million new residential properties completed. For context, in Dubai today, we have 600,000 residential properties that are completed or thereabouts. So what we're essentially talking about is building a city the size of Dubai in Riyadh in the next nine years. So there's gonna be a very significant amount of development yet to come. So what does all that mean then for pricing? Now, the National Transformation Plan was launched in 2016. And if we look at these two charts here, we're looking at the performance of residential values for apartments and villas in Riyadh and Jeddah. So from 2016 onwards, we've actually seen a decline 
in prices. But what's really interesting is if you look down at the, uh, at the bottom of those charts, as soon as the pandemic started at the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020, we actually started to see an acceleration in values, particularly in Riyadh for apartments. Um, when we look at villas as well, on the right-hand side there, you see villa prices in Riyadh also increased. However, in Jeddah, they seem to have stalled a little bit. And this comes back to some of those affordability issues that I mentioned earlier. So what we wanted to do was actually try and unpick that a little bit and try and understand, is it really affordability that's driving the flatlining of villa prices in Jeddah? So what we've done is we've taken a look at price growth since the start of the pandemic. So in Riyadh, over the course of the last 18 months, apartment prices are up about 13%, villa prices about 7.5%. Similar-ish sort of story in, in Jeddah for, for apartments, but villa prices in Jeddah down about 5.5%. And this is coming back to these affordability issues and structural changes in society that I mentioned before. So we took that a step further, and we tried to actually analyze house price to household income ratios, just to get a gauge on affordability. So the red bars there indicating the amount of income each household needs to save in 2016, and the green bars showing you what it is today. So if we pick out Riyadh villas, for instance, today, to buy a villa in Riyadh, you would need to save about 8.9 times your income in order to do that. In Jeddah, you have to save about 12 and a half times your income in order to purchase. Now, globally, an accepted affordability threshold is usually between four to six times your household income. So clearly for villas in Jeddah and Riyadh, we have breached that level of affordability. Also, remember the things I said about the younger generation not really wanting to live in villas anymore and preferring apartments. That is sort of very strongly hinting to us that villa prices are likely to remain under pressure, especially in cities outside of Riyadh, whereas apartments are likely to do better because people who are migrating internally in Saudi also are unlikely to want to buy in Riyadh if they're only there temporarily. They will want to buy in the cities from which they've come. So that is, that is a quick uh, summary of what, what we think is going on in the residential sector. I'll talk a little bit about the office market because I'm conscious of time as well. So just like we did for the residential sector, here we're looking at office lease rates for grade A and grade B space in Riyadh's per square meter across Riyadh, Jeddah, and the Demand metropolitan area. In Riyadh, for instance, over the course of the last 12 months, grade A rents are up 3%, grade B rents down 1.5%. In Jeddah, grade B rents down about a percent or so, and in DMA, grade B rents down about four and a half percent. For us, this is the really interesting story, this growing disparity between the performance of grade A and grade B rents. And we actually feel that this has its roots prior to the start of the pandemic. Now, one of the biggest challenges for businesses before COVID was the inability to attract and retain good staff. And this was a global phenomenon. Businesses were sort of mitigating against this challenge by securing best-in-class grade-A office space. We've all had to work from home throughout the course of the pandemic. We all know how important it is to have personal space, to have an amazing workspace. And as we all start to drift back into the office, we want to be proud of the office we work in. We want amazing internet access. And these days, we want to know that the building we're in ticks boxes for environmental, social, and governance considerations. This is a huge issue in Europe and the West at the moment. It hasn't yet arrived in the Middle East, but it will, because the next generation of workers care about sustainability issues. And actually, if this region is to continue attracting major multinational blue chip companies, they will not settle for a building that doesn't have a green or an environmental badge on it, be it LEED or BRIAM or WELL or even Wired Score, which is a business that now rates buildings on its digital connectivity. So essentially, the number of bars you have on your mobile phone for signal, the number of internet providers you have in the building, et cetera. These are actually factors that now influence rental premium that can be achieved for grade A space. One of the things that we've not done really well in this region is also manage to attract global institutional investment on scale. Right now, we know globally uh, the likes of AXA, BlackRock, Blackstone, they are ditching what they call brown assets in favor of green rated assets. And in a country like Saudi, we have a real opportunity to get the regulations right, deliver that right type of product, and we will attract that type of institutional investor. So what have rents done since the start of the pandemic? In Riyadh, grade A rents are up about 2.5%. In Jeddah, they're down about 3.5%. Now, just like I said before, 
Riyadh is being positioned as a hub for Saudi and for the Middle East. It is drawing in people from around the country. Similarly, it's doing the same thing with companies. Companies are shutting up shop elsewhere in the kingdom and relocating to Riyadh. And that comes on top of the fact, like Justin mentioned earlier, businesses are reducing their footprints in the wake of the pandemic by up to 30%. They are downsizing their office footprints. So those two issues combined together mean we are seeing an oversupply of office space in Jeddah, suggesting that rents there are going to remain under downward pressure. Uh, second last slide here. I mentioned earlier about the number of new businesses establishing themselves in the kingdom. We've got data here through to the end of the first quarter. And you can see we've had a record number of new international companies setting up in the kingdom, particularly in Riyadh. And my final slide is on office supply. On the left-hand side, we're looking at office supply projections for Riyadh. On the right-hand side, it's for Jeddah. So in Riyadh, we're expecting office supply to increase by about 30% or about a million square meters by the end of 2023. Um, and about 800,000 square meters is in King Abdullah Financial District itself. Um, on the right-hand side, if we look at Jeddah, we're expecting a supply increase of about 42% over the next three years, taking us to roughly 1.8 million square meters of space. Now, thinking about all the points I made earlier about businesses leaving other cities um, and the preference for grade A office space, that is strongly hinting to us that even grade A rents in cities like Jeddah are going to remain under downward pressure. That all being said, it's not the end of the road for Jeddah. A country the size of Saudi Arabia does need a second hub city, and Jeddah has historically performed that role incredibly well. We've got some amazing infrastructure in that city. We've got a brand new airport, high-speed rail links to Mecca and Medina. We've got a, um, a new port. We've got a budding cruise terminal, uh, cruise industry that's been set up, creating a new hospitality industry. In fact, the hospitality sector in Jeddah has been the strongest performing in the kingdom over the last two years. So when we think about some of the giga projects that have been announced as part of the National Transformation Plan, they are all concentrated on the western side of Saudi Arabia. And Jeddah has a real opportunity to emerge as that secondary hub in the kingdom. Over time, businesses will look for a secondary hub location, and Jeddah could well be that city. But for now, it does look like we're building more than that city needs, which is why our view is slightly skewed to the downside. So I hope that gives you a quick flavor of what's going on in the residential and office markets in, in Saudi Arabia. I will be around, so I'll be happy to take any questions. But thank you very much.